Chapters 8 through 10 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. A. Carter. Against Heresies by St. Irenaeus, Book 5. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rambo. Chapter 8. The gifts of the Holy Spirit which we receive prepare us for incorruption, render us spiritual, and separate us from carnal men. These two classes are signified by the clean and unclean animals in the legal dispensation. 1. But we do now receive a certain portion of His Spirit, tending towards perfection and preparing us for incorruption, being little by little accustomed to receive and bear God, which also the Apostle calls an earnest that is, a part of the honor which has been promised us by God, where he says in the epistle to the Ephesians, In which ye also, having heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believing in which ye have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. This earnest, therefore, thus dwelling in us, renders us spiritual even now, and the mortal is swallowed up by immortality. For ye, he declares, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. This, however, does not take place by a casting away of the flesh, but by the impartation of the Spirit. For those to whom he was writing were not without flesh, but they were those who had received the Spirit of God, by which we cry, Abba, Father. If therefore at the present time, having the earnest, we do cry, Abba, Father, what shall it be when on rising again we behold him face to face, when all the members shall burst out into a continuous hymn of triumph, glorifying him who raised them from the dead and gave the gift of eternal life? For if the earnest, gathering men into itself, does even now cause him to cry, Abba, Father, what shall the complete grace of the Spirit effect, which shall be given to men by God? It will render us like unto him, and accomplish the will of the Father, for it shall make man after the image and likeness of God. 2. Those persons then who possess the earnest of the Spirit, and who are not enslaved by the lusts of the flesh, but are subject to the Spirit, and who in all things walk according to the light of reason, does the Apostle properly term spiritual, because the Spirit of God dwells in them. Now spiritual men shall not be incorporeal spirits, but our substance, that is, the union of flesh and spirit, Receiving the Spirit of God makes up the spiritual man. But those who do indeed reject the Spirit's counsel, and are the slaves of fleshly lusts, and lead lives contrary to reason, and who without restraint plunge headlong into their own desires, having no longing after the divine Spirit, do live after the manner of swine and of dogs. These men, I say, does the Apostle very properly term carnal, because they have no thought of anything else except carnal things. 3. For the same reason, too, do the prophets compare them to irrational animals, on account of the irrationality of their conduct, saying, They have become as horses, raging for the females, each one of them neighing after his neighbor's wife. And again, man, when he was in honor, was made like unto cattle. This denotes that, for his own fault, he is likened to cattle, by rivaling their irrational life. And we also, as the custom is, do designate men of this stamp as cattle and irrational beasts. 4. Now the law has figuratively predicted all these, delineating man by the various animals. Whatsoever of these, says the scripture, have a double hoof and ruminate, it proclaims as clean. But whatsoever of them do not possess one or other of these properties, it sets aside by themselves as unclean. Who then are the clean? those who make their way by faith steadily toward the Father and the Son, for this is denoted by the steadiness of those who divide the hoof. And they meditate day and night upon the words of God, that they may be adorned with good works, for this is the meaning of the ruminants. The unclean, however, are those which do neither divide the hoof nor ruminate, that is, those persons who have neither faith in God nor do meditate on His words, and such is the abomination of the Gentiles. But as to those animals which do indeed chew the cud, but have not the double hoof, and are themselves unclean, we have in them a figurative description of the Jews, 
who certainly have the words of God in their mouth, but who do not fix their rooted steadfastness in the Father and in the Son. Wherefore they are an unstable generation. For those animals which have the hoof all in one piece easily slip, but those which have it divided are more sure-footed, their cleft hooves succeeding each other as they advance, and the one hoof supporting the other. In like manner, too, those are unclean which have the double hoof but do not ruminate. This is plainly an indication of all heretics, and of those who do not meditate on the words of God, neither are adorned with works of righteousness. To whom also the Lord says, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say to you? For men of this stamp do indeed say that they believe in the Father and the Son, but they never meditate as they should upon the things of God, neither are they adorned with works of righteousness. But as I have already observed, they have adopted the lives of swine and of dogs, giving themselves over to filthiness, to gluttony, and recklessness of all sorts. Justly, therefore, did the Apostle call all such carnal and animal, all those, namely, who, through their own unbelief and luxury, do not receive the divine spirit, and in their various phases cast out from themselves the life-giving word, and walk stupidly after their own lusts. The prophets, too, spake of them as beasts of burden and wild beasts. Custom, likewise, has viewed them in the light of cattle and irrational creatures, and the law has pronounced them unclean. Chapter 9 showing how that passage of the apostle which the heretics pervert should be understood, viz. flesh and blood shall not possess the kingdom of God. 1. Among the other truths proclaimed by the apostle there is also this one, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This is the passage which is adduced by all the heretics in support of their folly, with an attempt to annoy us and to point out that the handiwork of God is not saved, they do not take this fact into consideration, that there are three things out of which, as I have shown, the complete man is composed, flesh, soul, and spirit. One of these does indeed preserve and fashion the man, this is the spirit, while as to another it is united and formed, that is, the flesh. Then comes that which is between these two, that is, the soul, which sometimes indeed when it follows the spirit is raised up by it, but sometimes it sympathizes with the flesh and falls into carnal lusts. Those then, as many as they be, who have not that which saves and forms us into life eternal, shall be and shall be called mere flesh and blood. For these are they who have not the Spirit of God in themselves. Wherefore men of this stamp are spoken of by the Lord as dead. For says he, Let the dead bury their dead, because they have not the Spirit which quickens man. 2. On the other hand, as many as fear God and trust in his Son's advent, and who through faith do establish the Spirit of God in their hearts, such men as these shall be properly called both pure and spiritual, and those living to God, because they possess the Spirit of the Father who purifies man and raises him up to the life of God. For as the Lord has testified that the flesh is weak, so does he also say that the Spirit is willing. For this latter is capable of working out its own suggestions. If therefore any one admix the ready inclination of the spirit to be, as it were, a stimulus to the infirmity of the flesh, it inevitably follows that what is strong will prevail over the weak, so that the weakness of the flesh will be absorbed by the strength of the spirit, and that the man in whom this takes place cannot in that case be carnal, but spiritual, because of the fellowship of the spirit. Thus it is, therefore, that the martyrs bear their witness, and despise death, not after the infirmity of the flesh, but because of the readiness of the spirit. For when the infirmity of the flesh is absorbed, it exhibits the spirit as powerful. And again, when the spirit absorbs the weakness of the flesh, it possesses the flesh as an inheritance in itself, and from both of these is formed a living man, living indeed because he partakes of the spirit, but man because of the substance of flesh. 3. The flesh, therefore, when destitute of the Spirit of God, is dead, not having life, and cannot possess the kingdom of God. It is as irrational blood, like water poured out upon the ground. And therefore, he says, as is the earthy, such are they that are earthy. But where the Spirit of the Father is, there is a living man. There is the rational blood preserved by God for the avenging of those who shed it. There is the flesh possessed by the Spirit, forgetful indeed of what belongs to it in adopting the quality of the Spirit, being made conformable to the word of God. 
and on this account he the apostle declares as we have borne the image of him who is of the earth we shall also bear the image of him who is from heaven what therefore is the earthly that which was fashioned and what is the heavenly the spirit as therefore he says when we were destitute of the celestial spirit we walked in former times in the oldness of the flesh not obeying god so now let us receiving the spirit walk in newness of life obeying god inasmuch therefore as without the spirit of god we cannot be saved the apostle exhorts us through faith and chaste conversation to preserve the spirit of god lest having become non-participators of the divine spirit we lose the kingdom of heaven and he exclaims that flesh in itself and blood cannot possess the kingdom of god four if however we must speak strictly we would say that the flesh does not inherit but is inherited as also the lord declares blessed are the meek for they shall possess the earth by inheritance as if in the future kingdom the earth from whence exists the substance of our flesh is to be possessed by inheritance this is the reason for his wishing the temple i e the flesh to be clean that the spirit of god may take delight therein as a bridegroom with a bride as therefore the bride cannot be said to wed but to be wedded when the bridegroom comes and takes her so also the flesh cannot by itself possess the kingdom of god by inheritance but it can be taken for an inheritance into the kingdom of god for a living person inherits the goods of the deceased and it is one thing to inherit another to be inherited the former rules and exercises power over and orders the things inherited at his will but the latter things are in a state of subjection and are under order and are ruled over by him who has obtained the inheritance what therefore is it that lives the spirit of god doubtless what again are the possessions of the deceased the various parts of the man surely which rot in the earth but these are inherited by the spirit when they are translated into the kingdom of heaven for this cause too did christ die that the gospel covenant being manifested and known to the whole world might in the first place set free his slaves and then afterwards as i have already shown might consist them heirs of his property when the spirit possesses them by inheritance for he who lives inherits but the flesh is inherited in order that we may not lose life by losing that spirit which possesses us the apostle exhorting us by the communion of the spirit has said according to reason in those words already quoted that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god just as if he were to say do not err for unless the word of god dwell with and the spirit of god be in you and if ye shall live frivolously and carelessly as if ye were this only viz mere flesh and blood ye cannot inherit the kingdom of god chapter ten by a comparison drawn from the wild olive tree whose quality but not whose nature is changed by grafting he proves more important things he points out also that man without the spirit is not capable of bringing forth fruit or of inheriting the kingdom of god one this truth therefore he declares in order that we may not reject the engrafting of the spirit while pampering the flesh but thou being a wild olive tree he says hast been grafted into the good olive tree and been made a partaker of the fatness of the olive tree as therefore when the wild olive has been engrafted if it remain in its former condition viz a wild olive it is cut off and cast into the fire but if it takes kindly to the graft and is changed into the good olive tree it becomes a fruit-bearing olive planted as it were in a king's park paradiso so likewise men if they do truly progress by faith towards better things and receive the spirit of god and bring forth the fruit thereof shall be spiritual as being planted in the paradise of god but if they cast out the spirit and remain in their former condition desirous of being of the flesh rather than of the spirit then it is very justly said with regard to men of this stamp that flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of god just as if any one were to say that the wild olive is not received into the paradise of god admirably therefore does the apostle exhibit our nature and god's universal appointment in his discourse about flesh and blood and the wild olive for as the good olive if neglected for a certain time if left to grow wild and to run to wood does itself become a wild olive 
or again if the wild olive be carefully tended and grafted it naturally reverts to its former fruit-bearing condition so men also when they become careless and bring forth for fruit the lusts of the flesh like woody produce are rendered by their own fault unfruitful in righteousness for when men sleep the enemy sows the material of tares and for this cause did the lord command his disciples to be on the watch and again those persons who are not bringing forth the fruits of righteousness and are as it were covered over and lost among brambles if they use diligence and receive the word of god as a graft arrive at the pristine nature of man that which was created after the image and likeness of god two but as the engrafted wild olive does not certainly lose the substance of its wood but changes the quality of its fruit and receives another name being now not a wild olive but a fruit-bearing olive and is called so so also when man is grafted in by faith and receives the spirit of god he certainly does not lose the substance of flesh but changes the quality of the fruit brought forth i e of his works and receives another name showing that he has become changed for the better being now not mere flesh and blood but a spiritual man and is called such then again as the wild olive if it be not grafted in remains useless to its lord because of its woody quality and is cut down as a tree bearing no fruit and cast into the fire so also man if he does not receive through faith the engrafting of the spirit remains in his old condition and being mere flesh and blood he cannot inherit the kingdom of god rightly therefore does the apostle declare flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god and those who are in the flesh cannot please god not repudiating by these words the substance of flesh but showing that into it the spirit must be infused and for this reason he says the mortal must put on immortality and this corruptible must put on incorruption and again he declares but ye are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of god dwell in you he sets this forth still more plainly where he says the body indeed is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness but if the spirit of him who raised up jesus from the dead dwell in you he that raised up christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies because of his spirit dwelling in you and again he says in the epistle to the romans for if ye live after the flesh ye shall die now by these words he does not prohibit them from living their lives in the flesh for he was himself in the flesh when he wrote to them but he cuts away the lusts of the flesh which bring death upon a man and for this reason he says in continuation but if ye through the spirit do mortify the works of the flesh ye shall live for whosoever are led by the spirit of god these are the sons of god End of chapters 8 through 10. Recording by J. A. Carter, www.authenticlight.org.